Hello everybody, my name is Jeff Williams. I am a historian. I have a bachelor's degree in history from Concordia University, St. Paul. I'm working on a master's in history from St. Cloud State University. Served as a Civil War reenactor from, 20, uh, from 1993 to 2003. Uh, I've also uh, been appointed, was appointed and served on the Minnesota Civil War Commemoration Task Force, uh, appointed by Governor Mark Dayton uh, in 2011 and served through 2003. Uh, here I have a huge stack of books. These are different books that I have read over the years as I have studied Gettysburg. I have been to the battlefield on numerous occasions. I've walked to those hall hallowed grounds. Uh, it's still to this day one of my most favorite places to go in America. If you ever get a chance to visit Gettysburg, I highly encourage you to do it. We're going to be using some video clips from the American Battlefield Trust and some of the battle maps from the American Battlefield Trust. On the maps, if you see any yellow area uh, highlighted, uh, that's going to be the fact that they designed this to do a fundraising campaign to buy that land. Uh, and they bought a lot of land at Gettysburg over the years. So I don't want to get too wrapped up with that. Other than to say that they've put together some really fine products and that's what we're going to be using today as we explain what happened at Gettysburg. In November, late November, if you look at the Gettysburg campaign map, you'll find to the very bottom right, you'll see Fredericksburg. And then there's a river, the Rappahannock River. Uh, Burnside had the Army of the Potomac on the eastern side of the river and did not get across the river, delayed because of pontoon boats, did not get across the river to go and take Fredericksburg in time for uh, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia to take the heights on the west side of the town of, Gettysburg, uh, of uh, Fredericksburg. Now this becomes important for Gettysburg because there was a big battle fought at Fredericksburg through the town in December and then there was a mud mart and that ended up in a Confederate victory and then Burnside led what was called the mud march in uh, late January uh, tried encircling the Army of Northern Virginia and getting behind the, uh, you know, exploiting the, uh, the flank of the Confederacy, and the army got bogged down in the mud because there was a thaw. And then after that, Lincoln replaced Burnside with General Joseph Hooker, and Hooker then took the fight to, uh, to Lee at Fredericksburg, tried flanking him, and ended up uh, fighting a battle nearby at Chancellorsville. And if you go up the Rappahannock River, you will see Chancellorsville uh, a little bit to the northwest of Fredericksburg. And that ended up in a Confederate victory. Part of it was luck, part of it was good scouting from the Confederates, and part of it was the fact that uh, General Hooker got his bell rung when an artillery shell came crashing in too close to him and left him with a concussion. And so he was dealing with a concussion throughout the second half of the battle, and that did not bode well when your commanding general cannot think straight. And the Union forces retreated back to their winter camp. So the Union and Confederate armies had been in the same general vicinity for about seven months from uh, the beginning of November or mid-November through mid-June. And so this was an opportunity by mid-June that General Lee used to take his Confederates and march them up the Shenandoah Valley and you'll see this on the map to your left, on the Shenandoah Valley, marching into Pennsylvania, and then um, from there, it was the Union troops that uh, first, starting under Hooker, ended up uh, following, and then when Ho Hooker was not taking advantage of opportunities, uh, Lincoln decided to replace him on the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg with General George Meade. And so here we are, with 10 roads converging, there was um, troops that bumped into each other on June 30th. It was kind of an accidental but on purpose kind of thing uh, where Union and Confederate troops knew where each other was and they bumped into each other. And so on the morning of July 1st, here they came for the opening salvos of the Battle of Gettysburg. Now I'm going to leave this section here with this. June 30th was always the day of muster. 
So you write you write your uh, your name in the muster roll for pay, and you do a weapons inspection, and so at least for the uh, Union Army, and the Union Army had done that, but one regiment did not really remember to do that on the night of the thirtieth, and so on July first, after marching 125 miles from Fredericksburg, the members of the Second Wisconsin actually had um, were. Uh, did their inspection but didn't actually load and they uh, loaded on the run and that actually spelled catastrophe we will get into that in just a little bit so now that we have an update as to how the troops got to gettysburg remember this both union and confederate soldiers were tired they had already been at war for two years and they had just gotten done marching for 125 miles 125 miles from the state capital in St. Paul uh, puts you up around Sandstone. Uh, if you go straight north, you know, Sandstone to Cloquet, somewhere in that area if you go due north, and you end up from St. Paul into northern Iowa if you are heading south on Interstate 35. I mean, that, I think, is a fair approximation of how much of a distance. And they were not, they were not marching in, uh, in flat lands. This is extremely hilly, mountainous region uh, through the Shenandoah Valley. And so these guys were really, really tired by the time the battle began on the morning of July 1st. So we are now going to take a look at a clip. It's called The Coming Fury, and it explains the very beginning of the first day at Gettysburg. On the early morning of July 1st, 1863, Confederate General Henry Heath's division was approaching Gettysburg on the Chambersburg Pike from the west. He had been led to believe that he would meet no significant Union force. Three miles west of the town, uh, at 7.30 a.m., a Union cavalryman fired a single shot at Heath's column. Heath quickly deployed his men, advanced with a large skirmish line towards the town of Gettysburg. Slowly, the battle increased in size and fury as troops arrived on both sides. By 9.30 a.m., General Heath's division started to march across these open fields in front of us in a line of battle. And just as the Union cavalry force was being driven back, Union infantry arrived. And there was heavy fighting in the fields north and south of the Chambersburg Pike. In the early morning action, the Northern Army drove the Confederate Army back and maintained control of the fields and ridges west of the town. And there you have it. That was the very beginning. The very first troops uh, for the infantry have now arrived on the field around 9.30 in the morning on the 1st of July of 1863. See McPherson's Ridge, and that's where some of the early skirmishing occurred. Now remember where I mentioned, uh, when I mentioned... Uh, Reynolds, or catastrophe with the 2nd Wisconsin. As the 2nd Wisconsin was being pushed into battle, they had to load on the run. And it's one shot at a time. So when they're running, it doesn't take much for something to go off accidentally. And that may have, and nobody knows for sure what happened with Reynolds, but that may have actually uh, killed uh, Reynolds um, at 10, 15 a.m., on that morning, uh, pushing the second Wisconsin into battle. And we were dealing with rolling hills, so uh, Reynolds was on top of a hill, and then there was a little bit of a rolling area here, and so to shoot up and hit Reynolds was not, not inconceivable. Again, that's mere speculation. It is not gospel truth. Please do not treat it as such. But there was the first general killed at the battle. Uh, right away, first thing in the morning. So then uh, Wads uh, Wadsworth, Cutler, yeah, uh, Wadsworth took over the uh, first corps, and I know subsequently the first corps was also by Doubleday, Abner Doubleday. But nonetheless, uh, the Union and Confederate forces fought each other at McPherson's Ridge, and the first troops on the field went north of an unfinished railroad cut uh, as they were heading towards Oak Hill. And we're going to get to Oak Hill in just a little bit. And it was the railroad cut that cut off three Union regiments in an artillery battle 
uh, when they were getting overwhelmed by uh, Confederates from AP Hills Corps. And so we're going to look right now at fighting for the railroad cut, also by the American Battlefield Trust. We're standing in the famous McPherson's Ridge Railroad Cut, west of the town, the where there was fighting on the morning of the first day. The first infantry brigade to arrive for the Northern Army was General Lysander Cutler's brigade. They moved across the ridge in front of the seminary, across the unfinished railroad, and took position on a rise of ground just to the north and west of us. There, the 56th Pennsylvania fired the first infantry volley of the battle. But very quickly, Joseph Davis's Confederate Brigade swung into the open fields, outflanked part of Cutler's Brigade, and Cutler's men were forced to retreat back to Seminary Ridge and beyond towards the town of Gettysburg. The southern soldiers of Davis's brigade swung their line around and advanced towards the Chambersburg Pike, where more northern soldiers were coming onto the field. They took position in the unfinished railroad excavation. At the time, it seemed like a good idea. The cut provided protection, and they could lay a heavy fire across the Chambersburg Pike south of us. But the cut was a little bit deeper than they had anticipated, and it ended up being a trap. And so as they were trapped, a lot of Mississippians were, had surrendered. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, this is when you were starting to see the first casualties of the battle mounting up. Now the 11th Corps came in behind the 1st Corps and started going further up to, to Oak Ridge and a place called Barlow's Knoll. Uh, but eventually, uh, throughout the rest of the day, the uh, Confederates would actually win the day on the battlefield. So let's take a look now at Barlow's Knoll. We're here at Barlow's Knoll on the first day's battlefield in Gettysburg National Military Park. And it would be here on this knoll that Francis Barlow led his division of 2,300 men of the 11th Army Corps. Barlow took advantage of the knoll here because it's really the only significant ground on the first day's battlefield north of town. And he wanted to hold this key terrain. Uh, little did Barlow realize that coming down the Harrisburg Road was the division of General Jubal Early arriving on the battlefield. Uh, Jubal Early deployed his division and spearheaded by the Georgia Brigade of John Gordon would uh, attack Barlow here at the knoll and strike him on his vulnerable right flank, driving Barlow's men off the knoll. And this was the beginning of the end for the 11th Corps north of town on July 1st, 1863. One of the most famous human interest stories of the Battle of Gettysburg is the so-called uh, Barlow-Gordon incident. Allegedly, as the Union men are retreating, Francis Barlow is trying to stem that tide, and he's severely wounded. He's found by General Gordon. Gordon, thinking Barlow will surely die, uh, briefly tends to him, uh, makes sure Barlow's wife can travel through the lines and nurse him, uh, but Gordon leaves the field thinking Barlow will die. Many years later, according to John Gordon, uh, Gordon and Barlow meet again. Uh, both men are alive and thus begins a, a renewed friendship that began here on the Gettysburg battlefield. John Gordon in his, his memories after the war, in his book, and his public speeches tended to exaggerate some of his claims. So there is perhaps a bit of truth in this story. No doubt John Gordon perhaps saw Barlow on the field, but like many of his post-war claims, Gordon does tend to blow things out of proportion. Still, it remains one of the most famous human interest stories on this battlefield and could have perhaps happened anywhere on this knoll behind me. This is the beginning of the end for the Union at Oak Ridge and Oak Knoll and Barlow's Knoll. Uh, what happened was the Union forces got overwhelmed and the 11th Corps hasn't exactly been known for being the bravest troops out there. They're the ones who the Confederates broke through the lines at Chancellorsville just two months before. And according to a member of the 14th Brooklyn uh, Infantry who had written on a letter on July 28, 1863, which was published in the uh, Brooklyn Sunday Mercury, New York Sunday Mercury, the Flying 11th Flew. And James Wright, who uh, wrote in one of these books, said that he had, as the first Minnesota was coming to Gettysburg, that they saw all of these 
Troops with the core badge of the 11th Corps following back behind them. The one thing that you find that you, I have not found too many references to people from the 1st Corps having broken, but the, thir- the 11th Corps most certainly did. We had um, a running engagement retreat through town, in the town of Gettysburg. Uh, Jenny Wade, who was the, fir- the only civilian casualty, uh, of the war or of the battle, uh, she lost her life outside of her sister's house uh, in downtown Gettysburg, uh, and it, it's now pre- pre- preserved as the Jenny Wade House, but it, it was really her sister's house, um, and so she died there. But that was when the Union ran through town, Confederates chasing after, and then by late afternoon and into the evening, they began the familiar fish hook pattern known to the Gettys of the Gettysburg Campaign. You had Cemetery Hill kind of in the middle, uh, the northern middle part of the of the uh, Fishhook defensive lines. And then to your east, you had Culp's Hill, which was an anchor point. And then if you extend due, due south from Cemetery Hill, you had Little Round Top and then Big Round Top. And that w- and they didn't put really any troops on Big Round Top, but you'd find that on July 2nd that Culp's Hill and Little Round Top were two of the biggest targets of the day, uh, with a little bit at Cemetery Hill. Okay, so on the second day at Gettysburg, uh, General Lee had figured, well, first of all, uh, General Meade had arrived and set his co- headquarters uh, around Ziegler's Grove, uh, inside the defensive perimeter set by the inverted fish hook we keep hearing about. And then what he did was got all the reinforcements brought up into line as soon as he possibly could. That meant that they were going to reinforce the little round top area as quick as they could. They took their existing troops and put them on Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill and as many more people as they could get in to reinforce the center. They dug in all night long. Uh, and then uh, there was actually a lot of fighting going on on Culp's Hill. So troops that fought on the first day ended up fighting overnight and really for the next couple of days all at Culp's Hill, not getting really much of a rest. General Lee relied on uh, General Longstreet uh, to organize the attack for the second day, and it was Longstreet that took until like 4.30 in the afternoon until to get all of his people into position. So they really wasted a whole day on the 2nd. Instead of fighting at like 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, they, were, they weren't in place launching an attack until late in the afternoon. Uh, so what we're going to see now is we're going to show the map with East Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill. If you take a look at the blue line to the bottom... That's the that's just south of the, the, the of the borough of Gettysburg, south of the downtown area, and that's kind of that fish hook pattern. Uh, that's the the flank. That's the barb where you see Wadsworth and Geary, uh, Ames. This is the interior of the Union line. By late in the afternoon on the second of July, we have Longstreet who finally got his troops moving, and they were attacking the southern part of the Union lines, and even though this map really looks to be like a complete mess, you take a look at the blue from the very south, and you're going to see Little Round Top. Here we are atop Little Round Top, near General Warren statue. And looking from here, in 2010, we're looking at a rather similar scene to what Governor Kemble Warren would have seen on July 2nd, 1863, with the exception of a couple of cars and monuments here and there. Um, however, one of the goals of a national military park is to keep the battlefield looking the way that it did during the battle. And what you're seeing behind me is a scene very similar to what we would have seen then. Um, the trees have been cut to a very similar pattern to what the troops would have seen at the time. And from here, from right near this area, is where Governor Kemble Warren looked to Seminary Ridge over my right shoulder to see that the Confederate attack was in fact forming around the Union flank and that Little Round Top better be occupied. Now, as you go toward the north and as I walk on some of these rocks here, you'll be able to see 
a scene behind me very similar also to what was during the battle. Some of the patches of woodlots you see over my shoulders were actually just like that at the time of the battle, and those woodlots were the very ones that concerned Union General Dan Sickles that his position on Little Round Top might have been secure, but north of here, those intervening woodlots would have allowed the enemy to get up right near his position um, before he could try to stop them with his artillery. Okay, I'm going to show you the map right now where you have the Wheatfield Road uh, to the north, and then you also have a Strong Vincent's to the south, and then you see this little tiny spot called the 20th Main on the very, very far right of the map, and that happens to be where General, well, then Colonel uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain led his regiment down the hill in a bayonet charge and swept the Confederates right off of the, uh, off the hill. And he had earned the Medal of Honor for his uh, service there uh, at Little Round Top. And that was kind of the beginning of the end for going that far in on the line. And let's take a look right now at the video clip of the 20th Maine's fight. On the afternoon of July 2nd, Little Round Top was unoccupied for a while. Through a chain of events set in motion by Governor Kemble Warren, Union Colonel Strong Vincent would ultimately bring his brigade of 1,300 men to the hill. Strong Vincent will end up posting his leftmost regiment, the 20th Maine, here on what is now known as Vincent's Spur. This, at this time, would be the left flank of the Union Army of the Potomac on Little Round Top. Um, they were not here very long. They didn't have time to build the stone walls that are seen around me today. Uh, but the, they just got into position when the Southerners come off a of big round top, weary after their very long march, wearier than any other Southerners on the field, come and attack this position. And the Texans and Alabamians are repulsed. They attack this position again, and they're repulsed again. They make a tough attempt to try to capture a little round top for the other side, um, but fail, barely, because of some Union reinforcements from the 140th New York. The 20th Maine then becomes uh, the subject of an intense fight with two Alabama regiments, the 15th Alabama, the 47th Alabama, and for more than 30 to 45 minutes this fight goes back and forth like a great wave until a third of the men from Maine are down, a third of the men from Alabama are down. Both sides are trying to use up ammunition from their dead and wounded comrades, and the Southerners are now beginning a movement around the flank around this monument to attack the 20th Maine, not from this direction, but from this direction as well. The main men see that coming. They bend back their line beyond the monument in this fashion in order to repulse the southern attacks, which come again with equal ferocity. They will fail as well. The southerners make one last attempt. It will fail. The Union then is out of ammunition, and that is when uh, the 20th Maine will fix bayonets onto the end of their rifles and charge down into the weary southerners, who, after staying up all night and marching over mountains and, and up Big Round Top and down and making a various ferocious attack, had finally had enough. And hundreds of the Southerners were captured. The Union troops, some of them came off of Little Round Top, occupied Big Round Top in front of me, and were said to be going all the way on to Richmond, but they would slow down. Little Round Top was, of course, not the only part of that section of the battle. Uh, after the Confederate, Confederates were repulsed there at the Devil's Den and at Little Round Top, there was also the Peach Orchard. Uh, and then the wheat field, well, wheat field and peach orchard are kind of considered uh, two. Uh, we're going to th throw up. And we're getting late in the day here. Uh, we're at 5.30. 5.30 to 7.30 at night is when we're getting into a battle of the uh, peach orchard. And this featured uh, Dan Sickles' third corps. Uh, and remember when I mentioned that they were out a little ways now, the video just explained a little bit about how Sickles was concerned about the wood lines and needed to get out, and that's true. And here he fought a very large battle in the Peach Orchard and right off the Emmitsburg Road, uh, which was further to the uh, west of um, where the rest of the line was, going back towards Little Round Top. That was getting wrapped up around 6.30 at night. So we're going to look right now at a video on the carnage in the wheat field. 
I'm standing in the wheat field, and during the battle, the wheat was actually chest high, ready to be harvested, until some New York troops actually marched through the wheat field, and from then on, this would be trampled wheat in this area. But there were more things than that on the soldiers' mind. The main troops at first, uh, the 17th Maine under de Trobriand, were actually uh, on the south border of the wheat field. They got attacked by Arkansas, then by Georgia troops, coming from the south, actually, toward the north. Ultimately, they're going to have a threat over on their flank there, and they refuse their line to fight against some of these South Carolina. Carolinians. More South Carolinians arrive just as two Union brigades from the 5th Corps actually arrive to support de Trobriand's troops. The fight intensifies from there. Some of the troops fall back, some return back to their positions as an entire Union division enters the fray. Uh, John C. Caldwell, and then you're going to have more Georgia brigades enter the fray. And this is a particularly intense fight. We're still trying to figure out what happened here. It changed hands six times here in the wheat field, and it would become the bloodiest spot of Gettysburg. It was said you could walk from one side of the other just stepping on bodies as a result of the whirlpool of battle that took place here. It was a virtual carpet of blue, gray, and red, one of the most horrible places to see after the battle, specifically because after the fighting was over, the wheat field was a no man's land with Confederates over there and Union troops over on the east side in front of Little Round Top, and the cries from the wounded that night were supposedly unbearable, made worse actually because wild boars had escaped from a pen and were actually disemboweling uh, wounded Union troops who were too hurt to crawl away. A horrible place to be on the night of July 2nd. And yes, getting eaten by pigs. That's a horrible, horrible, disgusting, disgusting thing. But folks, that's the way it was over there. Uh, I can't even begin to imagine being one of the troops there in the, in the wheat field in the peach orchard uh, having to deal with that. But notice how now how the battle lines have shifted. So now you have, this is where the gap really came in. Sickles, of course, had the woodland areas, as was explained, that he was concerned about, so he moved his troops in front of that, and then he had the rest of the troops, uh, the 5th Corps, over at Little Round Top, which they had... And now, as we had in the weed field, what's happening is those lines are getting separated even further, and now you had more Confederates pouring in. I guess filled the gap. Yes, folks, Minnesotans. The 1st Minnesota... Volunteer Infantry Regiment. They came, the Second Corps, under the uh, leadership of General Winfield Scott Hancock, came up to the next troop in line, the next regiment, and Hancock asked Colville, who was leading the, uh, the, the regiment at the time, what regiment is this? Colonel Colville replies, First Minnesota, sir, and get him in the line. And Hancock orders the charge. Here is what happened. We're standing on Cemetery Ridge and behind me is the monument to the 1st Minnesota Infantry. Beyond that is the Pennsylvania Memorial. On the late afternoon, early evening of July the 2nd, this part of the Union line was in great threat. The Confederate attack, which was coming from my right, from the west, General Longstreet's Corps was driving everything before it. And there was very little infantry on this part of the federal line. They were trying to hold this part of the line only with artillery. And General Winfield Hancock, the commander of the Second Corps, guided a New York infantry brigade right past me. They counterattacked against General Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade and drove them back, but it still wasn't enough. There was an Alabama brigade under General Wilcox approaching the position that I'm in uh, unchecked. General Hancock rode up into this area, found the 1st Minnesota Infantry. It was only 262 men. He ordered their colonel to attack the entire Confederate brigade, which outnumbered him probably six or seven to one. The regiment made the charge. They lost two-thirds of their men. Hancock would say later, if I lost every man in the regiment, I would have done so, because the, re the attack had to be made. By the end of the day, it was sacrifices like the 1st Minnesota, Willard's New York Brigade that turned the tide on this part of the field. So despite outstanding fighting by the Confederate soldiers, it had been matched by outstanding fighting by the Union soldiers, and the Union Army still held all the key terrain. They held Little Round Top, and they held Cemetery Ridge, and the Union left was secure. The 1st Minnesota was able to buy 15 minutes worth of time at Plum Run in order to get reinforcements brought up from other parts of the battlefields from the 2nd Corps. 
I've gone through a lot of the records of the first Minnesota, and I've seen an interesting pattern occur, that those who were the first ones to fall during that charge were the ones who ended up getting wounded in the, uh, in the legs, the feet, the lower torso. It seems that the closer they got to the Confederates, the more accurate the shooting became, and that was when we ended up taking on more of a loss of life. Uh, head shots occurred when they were very close to the hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but being shot in, you could tell from bottom to top where you were in that charge by what kind of wound you received. And it's, it's an amazing thing when you look back at these records. And we didn't have body armor back then. It was you ran in as a massive troop against a massive, that's what made the Civil War so bloody, that you went in and you shot people and there was no protection. And yet, that was a very important role for the outcome of the battle. If that gap would have been breached, just like on the first day with the 14th Brooklyn and 6th Wisconsin holding the line at the railroad cut to give the Union forces a chance to escape, here, if the 1st Minnesota did not hold the line, that could have cracked things open enough to give the Confederates enough to blow open the flanks. So, get a way. Roll right up at the edge of the Union of the uh, Union lines and go right up that fish hook, and you could take out troops like you wouldn't believe. That saved the line, and that pretty much ended the battle that night. I mean, little stuff going on. This took care of the wheat field, and the peach orchard, and little round top section. At Cemetery Hill, you had a little bit of engagements that, la that continued on until 9.30. Of course, Culp's Hill, that stayed go rolling all night. And that pretty much ended the second day. Now, on the third day, 3rd of July, uh, Culp's Hill continued going on. A little round top in Devil's Den had some skirmishes a little bit in the uh, afternoon. Uh, but it really wasn't too bad because General Lee had figured out overnight that what he was going to do was send every other available troop right into the center of Union lines. He figured that if they had hit the flanks, that Meade would reinforce all of the flanks. So he would reinforce Culp's Hill, he would reinforce Cemetery Hill, he would reinforce Little Round Top, meaning that the strength would be in the center. And so starting at 2 o'clock in the afternoon... You had an artillery barrage. It was about 1.30 in the afternoon. Uh, I'm going to find the map here. The Pickett's artillery. The Pickett's charge artillery position. So we see a lot of artillery was just called up and uh, brought in closer uh, to the federal positions. And they had a artillery duel. The artillery duel was so loud it could be heard in Pittsburgh, which is about 150 miles away. I'm standing at the North Carolina Monument on Seminary Ridge. From this point, General Johnson Pettigrew's brigade of North Carolina troops and other troops launched their portion of the assault on the afternoon of July 3rd. Now, Robert E. Lee still thought that he could win this battle on the morning of July 3rd. Remember, he had defeated a portion of the Union Army in detail on July 1st. On July 2nd, he had not gained what he wanted on Cemetery Ridge, but Lee had accomplished what he considered to be a number of partial successes, most notably the capture of the Peach Orchard along the Emmitsburg Road, which Lee hoped to use as an artillery platform to assault Cemetery Ridge. So the morning of the 3rd, Lee is still feeling pretty good and he's feeling like he can win this battle. Now initially in the morning, Lee wants to renew attacks on the Union flanks. Unfortunately, Richard Ewell was engaged over at Culp's Hill attacking the Union right before General James Longstreet was ready to attack the Union left. So Lee realized that he couldn't coordinate attacks on both ends of the Union line. He had to look for a plan B. Plan B is the assault that will happen in the afternoon along the center of the Union line on Cemetery Ridge that we popularly know today as Pickett's Charge. Pickett, Pettigrew, and Tremble assault, all right? And that's uh, nine brigades. They're gonna come like, uh, there are two big blocks in a line. And where that little uh, 
U shape in the woods there. By the way, you see the monument over there? That's the Lee Monument. We all saw Lee. And look at there in back of you is General Meade. So we have Meade and Lee looking at each other. And you notice that the Meade statue is a little higher than Lee, because <laughs> Meade wins. So you get to be higher. All right? Now, to our left, the patch of woods on the left, Pickett's men will be there. How many people saw the Gettysburg movie? Remember they have the artillery shelling and all the Pickett's men are in the woods? Not true, only one regiment's in the woods. They're really in front of the woods, but there's a big dip in the ground there. You wouldn't even see them. Big dip in the ground. All right, then there's the space where uh, Lee is. It's called, the, well, the point of the woods, that point where the, the trees are right there where Pickett's men. The Lee watches most of the Pickett's charge from that spot right there. Now, the woods to the left and back of those woods would be Pettigrew and Tremble's division. All they have to do is come straight ahead because Lee wants to attack this angle right here. See how the stone wall zigzags like a Z? It's a salient position, very hard to defend. It looks really awkward. That's why we have the line of monuments down there, the Union Army, then this big space, and then the line of monuments here. Because if you were on my tour, I would have told you if you see a line of monuments, it's a Union battle. It was a line of battle that killed a lot of people. We're going to show you the, uh, the map from... Um Starting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through a series of maps. So we'll go from 2 to 2.30. Then we will go from uh, 3 o'clock to 3.30. 3.30 .30 to 3.45 p.m. Now, that you see the distance from that video. It took a while to march across this. And then here it is, 4 o'clock to 4.15 p.m., and you notice how much of the Confederate, how many of the Confederate regiments actually had just gotten decimated. And then there's your artillery. That pretty much was the end of Gettysburg. There were no more troops left to fight. There's 16,000 people who marched across that field, and they were decimated. And it was ugly, it was bloody, but that was considered the high water mark of the Confederacy. What ended up happening afterwards, Confederates couldn't find any more reinforcements. And this is when the War of Attrition began on trying to conserve troop strength for the Confederates. They didn't have any reinforcements. All of their able-bodied people were already in service. They couldn't bring too many more people, so now it was just a slow death of the Confederate Army that went on for the next two years. And then finally, after 11 months' siege at Petersburg, the Confederate, in 1864, in 1865, the Confederates were able to break out towards Appomattox Courthouse, and then that's where General Lee surrendered to General Grant, and then that be was the beginning of the end for the Confederacy. And with so many wounded still on the, on the field, it impacted the Gettysburg community for a long time afterwards. And so then by November, the Soldiers National Cemetery had opened up, and we're going to hear about that right now. We're standing in the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg. I'm personally standing in the section of the Minnesota soldiers. In fact, every soldier in this section was in the 1st Minnesota Infantry. And all about me, there's 3,512 graves of soldiers who died in the Battle of Gettysburg. The cemetery was established here after the battle because this position was such a critical point for the Union Army during the three days of the battle. It also was established here because it's adjacent to the Evergreen Cemetery, which was already here at the time of the battle. It was dedicated in November of 1863, November 19th. On that day, Edward Everett gave the keynote address, and he spoke not at the Soldiers' Monument, which is directly behind me, but actually up in the Evergreen Cemetery on a temporary wooden platform. Everett's speech was a great speech, but it's not the one that we remember. We remember the two-minute speech that President Lincoln gave after Everett that defined what the war was about. But Lincoln's speech had universal concepts. It spoke beyond just that period. It talked about what this war was about, why all these men who were about me laying in these graves, why they died. And Lincoln said it was for a new birth of freedom for this country. And it was for a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And now we're going to hear from President Abraham Lincoln with his famous Gettysburg Address. Thanks for watching.
Four score and seven years ago, our Father brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we're engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as the final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. <clears throat> the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be here dedicated to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion, and that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.